Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks, everybody. It's um, awesome to be back I in Stanford. Um, I, I should let you know that I knew about the SVD before I got the amazing pleasure of meeting Jean Golub. Oh, okay. And then from Jean, I got to meet Michael. And then with Michael, Priya and I collaborated on the higher order GSVD. I will tell you all about it. Um, and I will tell you about multi-tensor decompositions for personalized cancer diagnostics, prognostics, and therapeutics. I should just mention um, uh, for uh, conflict of interest that we now have a startup which we call Eigengene. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and um, yeah. And that also moving from Austin to Utah essentially enabled me the opportunity to work on questions in cancer because we have this fantastic cancer institute there. I should mention that. So um, with the Human Genome Project around the year 2000, there were all these omic technologies that came about. And the omic technologies are now being adopted to the cancer clinic. The, the omic technologies essentially enable measuring the genomic signals that cells generate and read as they go, they go about cellular processes, but the complete genomic signals. So for example, DNA on the complete genomic scale, RNA, uh, to, uh, the DNA as it gets transcribed into RNA, again for all the genes, protein binding to DNA and binding to RNA, again on the complete genomic scale. So those were data that were not available before and now uh, available thanks to these technologies. And the question back when the Human Genome Project was going, uh, uh, getting going and when these technologies came about, as the question is still today when the technologies are being adopted in the cancer clinic, um, is what to do with the data, how to figure out what the data actually mean. And coming from physics, so you see that was my uh, PhD dissertation, I was with Yoshi Yamamoto here, here at Stanford in Applied Physics. And coming from physics, the first thing that I wanted to do looking at this data and that um, in a sense we're still doing in my lab is to use mathematics that generalizes the, the frameworks that underlie theoretical physics. 
And uh, those of you from physics might know that uh, the mathematical description of the physical activity of the prism, for example, that takes white light and separates it into its color components is described by the singular value decomposition. I know that in computer science you think about the singular value decomposition mainly as the building block in the page rank algorithm or as the building block that won the Netflix challenge. Right? Is that how you think about it? But coming from physics, singular value composition is the mathematical description of this physical activity, say, of the prism. So we set out to use it, see what it might mean in biology, and see how we might generalize it to understand this kind of omic data. And very early on, we essentially invented the eigengenes and I guess eigensamples by looking at a single uh, matrix of this kind of data. In this case, we're looking at data from the budding yeast, which is a model organism in biology. We have here along the y-axis all the genes, and along the x-axis we have time points during cell division. And the singular value decomposition, we, oh, and the data that are tabulated here are um, RNA abundance levels for all the genes in East. In green, we essentially have negative numbers or expression levels below steady state. In red, we have positive numbers or expression levels above steady state. And in this very early work, we already were able to show that the uh, right-hand singular vectors and the left-hand singular vectors that the singular value decomposition, decomposition gives us essentially describe cellular processes and states that underlie this one data set. So in the same way that those um, eigenvectors or eigenfunctions have physical meaning, they also have biological meaning. And I should also note that um, in this work we also seen that the biological meaning sometimes may very well refer to batch effects that are superimposed on the data. This is a big problem for people who work with this data. So uh, just to let you know that it is possible to describe both the biology and the batch effects by using this one mathematical framework. Um, but then very quickly it became obvious, as it became obvious to many people today in very many fields where people work with data, that it is important to look at uh, combinations of different data sets. And then, for example, if we want to put two data sets together, say this very cell cycle data, but now with protein binding to DNA data, where we're looking at the binding of replication initiation proteins and transcription factors which are known to drive the cell division. Um, so if we want to put these data sets together, we might use generalizations of the SVD, say the pseudo-inverse projection which is computed through the SVD, or we might use generalizations of the SVD for um, say tensors where we have additional dimensions, maybe because we measured uh, the same data under different conditions, we repeated the experiment under different conditions, and essentially gave us different data, but now we have many matrices that we could fit in a tensor and we get this additional dimension. So already very early on by putting these different data together, we found that it is possible to uh, mathematically derive correlations from the data that appear to suggest causal coordination. And you never know if a causal coordination is really there or not, so we needed to test it. And in this particular case, when we were looking at cell cycle data from East, we teamed up with John Diffley, who was the deputy director of Cancer Research UK. Here's, oops, <coughs> sorry. So here's John here to experimentally test this correlation that we found by looking at uh, publicly available data. The correlation essentially suggested how DNA replication might affect RNA expression in a way that wasn't known at the time. And in the experiment, we really collected this kind of cell cycle time course data set under different conditions. We repeated this initial measurement under different conditions. And by doing so, we were able to see that yes, our prediction is correct. So we were able to also conclude that those kind of matrix and tensor modeling of the data 
can correctly, not just predict, but correctly predict previously unknown mechanisms, okay? So th this is just briefly to tell you about what we did before. To do that in this particular instance, as I said, we're looking at data that are in the shape of a tensor, and this is very popular today in computer science and in other fields, and partly because data come <laughs> in, uh, in shapes that are much more complex than the shape of a single two-dimensional table or a matrix. So for example, they have additional orders or additional access in the data. In our case, it's again the same cell cycle, but under different conditions. The conditions um, are the additional access. And the question is how to find patterns there, how to generalize the SVD to this case. And the reason, again, we wanted to generalize the SVD was because the first instance we used it, it was so successful. I'm not saying that this is necessarily the answer to all of our questions, but at a zeroth order, it seems to give um, great understanding of the data that we didn't have before. So while it is possible to go from the SVD to say non-negative matrix factorizations or to independent component analysis or other ways to analyze a single matrix, we said, well, we actually prefer to put different layers of data together, so we will generalize the SVD in this direction. And um, as you might know, th those who are interested in our in computer science, there are different ways to generalize the SVD once you add even just a, a, a single order or a single uh, access to your data. And one of them was described in, in this work by Levin de Lathaware, um, where essentially you find patterns in the data just like with the SVD. You see we have right singular vectors, left singular vectors. We now have also, I guess if this is X and this is Y, we now have a Z direction, so we have Z singular vectors. But now we have a core that is not necessarily non-negative and definitely not necessarily all orthogonal. It's a dense um, general core, unlike what we have in SVD where we have non-negative diagonal matrix for the core of the diagonalization. So it is possible to diagonalize, uh, sorry, to generalize the SVD in such a way that other properties of it are maintained, but we found that this generalization works the best. To use this generalization, we had to define the meaning of the, of, of the patterns and the structures of the patterns that we find, that we see in the data. I mean, that was a little more straightforward with the SVD. For the generalized SVD, we had to note that really now we're describing the tensor as a superposition of uh, rank one subtensors, if you like, and that the rank one subtensors have coefficients which uh, really we can select them all with positive, with, uh, to be positive numbers, uh, depending on how we set those patterns, the singular vectors in the three matrices in this case, or the whatever number of matrices in general. And by, this, uh, by doing this, we can figure out which are the uh, more significant combinations of patterns across X, across Y, and also across Z, which are the significant combinations that we need to interpret in the data. Uh, you see, normally, there, or sometimes, there seems to be a disconnect between the computing and the interpretation of the data. We try to keep the interpretation of the data um, to be with uh, relation to what the computing does. It's important to interpret things so that everything is consistent. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't work. Um, we also had to define an entropy, and we had to define a degenerate subtensor space. So by doing all of that, we were able to interpret the data and to see that, yes, uh, our prediction actually holds experimentally. I should also note, I mentioned batch effects, and I mentioned that they are very relevant for omic data. Um, th those that are not familiar with measurement technologies, they might not know that, say, the biologists that I was working with at the time, they didn't know, those kind of batch effects are relevant for all high throughput measurements. So, for example, people encounter them in astrophysics when they look at sky surveys and they take many, they measure many very numbers at once. Those are very relevant for traditional biomedical engineering signals like EEG, ECG, MRI. And already with those traditional biomedical engineering signals, these kind of batch effects are being separated from the biology, biological or medical signal of interest. 
by some method that at its core has the singular valid decomposition. I, I, I had the great pleasure to learn this from Sabine von Hoffel when she was uh, on a sabbatical from KU Leuven and visiting Jean Golub <laughs> just at the time that I guess uh, I got to meet Jean. I, I didn't know that at the time, but then you could go and see it, and partly it's maybe because um, th th all these d devices in the hospital that analyze these data, they, uh, the, the algorithms and the software, it comes from medical physicists, and as I mentioned, the singular value composition underlies theoretical physics. So it's a very powerful tool for physicists and elsewhere. Um, I, I just as a quick example, for example, they use this if you have a problem of measuring the ECG of a fetus, and the fetus is inside its mom's belly, and I guess um, th 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 when you make the measurement, there is the, the strong signal, there is the weak signal of the, uh, the fetus heart, there is a stronger signal from the mother's heart, which is obviously bigger, and then there is even a strongest signal, and that comes from the electricity in the hospital, as it turns out, you know, you, you find out things you, you don't know. Um, but then the SVD and its generalizations, not really in the style that I'm describing, but more in the style of going to NMF and ICA and all the generalizations of working it with, um, with uh, two dimensional data sets or matrix form data sets, those generalizations are able to separate the batch effect from the signal of the, uh, the baby. So um, th this works and maybe it's not surprising that it also works in omic data and just quickly to show you here, so those are again the cell cycle data and we have, you see this uh, uh, red line, this is the constant across the, even, the odd time points and the even time points in the cell cycle data and then you see, maybe, uh, maybe I'll show you here, this is the strongest pattern, then you could see some cycling patterns in um, orange and in green, those are the patterns we would expect in the cell division, but then you see also this blue step function, this is the second most significant pattern in the data, it separates the odd time, the even time points, sorry, from the odd time points, and those were samples that were sent to us by John Diffley in different FedEx boxes. So there were different batch effects superimposed on them. We kept them also into separate hybridization batches, um, just to keep um, all the batch effects into this kind of separation. And once we see this very nice step function, we can easily filter it out of the data without throwing out any samples or any genes. Uh, th this is something that uh, the SVD enables. So then, of course, uh, we were very excited and we said, well, yes, we can find principles of nature by finding these kind of correlations in the data because correlations may, not necessarily, but they may underlie causal coordination. And um, just an example that I like to give, and I, I should mention that really the singular value composition also um, really gave us quantum mechanics, but going into even earlier mechanics, or even before we had Newtonian mechanics, when we, when, when we had Kepler, so Kepler worked with data, the data were in matrices, like this one data set from Tycho Brahe, and here he has along the x-axis, he has different planetary bodies, stars uh, uh, and, and moons and planets, and along the y-axis he has um, time and recorded are the positions of those bodies in the sky at these times. Many people at the time were collecting this kind of data, just like many people are collecting omic data today. Uh, Kepler looked at the Brahe's data because those were the best quality data. So for the experimentalists among the, amongst us, the quality of your data does matter very much. <laughs> <laughs> really, the mathematics there's a, cannot do miracles. Uh, the mathematics prefers high-quality data, but it could separate the batch effect still, all right, from the biological signals. So Kepler discovered patterns in this data, and you would say, well, you know, th and those were essentially his planetary laws of motion. And you could say, well, he discovered an ellipse. Uh, I'm not sure I see ellipses in my data, even though arguably those uh, cell cycle traveling waves are a form of ellipses. And so I, I want to point out the ellipse Kepler discovered first, 
because he knew the mathematics of ellipses from conical cuts. He had the mathematical technology, essentially. His third law of motion, the one that gave rise to uh, Newton's law of um, gravitation, of universal gravitation, that one, we used to think about it these days as a law of regression correlation. You look at NASA's website, it's regression correlation. How do we calculate regression correlation? Well, one way is with the SVD for looking at totally square. Did Kepler have totally square? No. Did Kepler have the SVD? No, he didn't. He did not have the mathematical technology to find a correlation in the data. So, you know, let's not sneeze at our ability to find correlations. It took him nine years. <laughs> It took him nine years to find his third law of planetary motion or convince himself that he is certain that there is a correlation in the data um, after he found the ellipse. The ellipse was easy, the correlation took nine years. So at that point, and this is when I'm getting to the generalized SVD <laughs> uh, and our work with Michael, so at that point we were wondering, well, what is the mathematics that we need? What is the mathematical technology that might be missing for cases where we adopt omic technology to the clinic, where we're looking at personalized medicine? And the structure of data in personalized medicine, this is the structure of the data, for example. This is a toy example. Um, it's that of two matrices. Well, I could show you here. We have here two matrices. Here's one matrix, here's another. And they are... Um, they have the same x-axis, essentially say the same set of patients along the x-axis. And then the y-axis could be any. Because in each matrix we might be measuring something different about the exact same set of patients. We might have many more matrices, but as I said, let's start with just two. So here in this example, that really was our toy example, but then proved to be very useful and we're hoping to get it into the clinic. So in this star example, we looked at data from the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a project of the National Cancer Institute, to record very many types of genomic data relevant for different types of cancers. And this cancer, this is astrocytoma, or well, uh, brain tumors. And uh, the, uh, the, the, so the patients are bra uh, brain, brain cancer patients. And uh, here in this particular data set we have different grades of the disease, but some of you might have heard, those who are not say experts in brain cancer, you might have heard about the grade 4, the most, um, uh, I guess, the most uh, devastating form of the disease, which is um, glioblastoma or GBM, so you might have heard of that. And there are lower grades, grades 2 and 3 in this particular data that we got. And in one matrix we have data, very raw data, that describe the genomes of, uh, the normal genomes of the patients, essentially measured in blood samples from the patients. And on, the, on here, in the right hand side, so that's on the left, on the right hand side we have the genomes of the tumors of the patients. And you can see again with this coloring scheme that uh, the normal data set is mainly black, it's mainly at steady state, there could be some variations that are not obvious to, uh, 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 easily obvious in this particular visualization scheme, but we could see them. Definitely we see that uh, we have here some green along um, this lower chunk of the y-axis, this is the X chromosome. This is copy number, abundance numbers or abundance levels of DNA from regions on the X chromosome and in pa some patients they appear deleted relative to the autosome. And you remember the autosome, those are all the other chromosomes, the autosome we have in two copies in our bodies. The X chromosome in uh, females, we have two copies, but in male, just one copy. So really, this, is, this variation is completely normal. It's a variation we expect between the male and the female patients, okay? The normal variation in the normal, da normal genome data set. The tumor data set includes a lot more variation. We can see huge chunks of uh, chromosomes deleted, say most of 10 in many of the patients, the short arm of 9 in many of the patients, we see amplification of chromosome 7 in many of the patients, so 
dose, DNA abundance levels, so sometimes we used to think about cancer in terms of point mutations, but really in terms of copy number, there are gross variations between the tumors and the normals. What does the generalized SVD do? Well, just like the SVD, it separates each matrix into three matrices. We have left-hand um, vectors, we have right-hand vectors, and we have cores that are diagonal, non-negative, uh, matrices. We see, however, that unlike, I suppose, the SVD of each of these matrices separately, the right-hand um, singular vectors are identical in both factorizations. What are the right-hand singular vectors? These are the patterns of variation across the patients. Let me find the cursor. Here is the axis of the patients. This is the common axis to both data sets. These are patterns of variation across the patients that the mathematics tells us are in some form or another evident in both data sets. The mathematics need this pattern to describe both data sets. But some, but, but some of these patterns have a really high coefficient in, say, the tumor data set relative to the normal. They're, much more ex they're almost exclusive to the tumor relative to the normal. Some are almost exclusive to the normal relative to the tumor. And some are of common uh, coefficients or common significance in the normal and the tumor data set. And you see now how we can take the GSVD, which, say, usually in computer science we use to um, for, for algorithmic purposes and use it to interpret data by looking at the ratio, the, rela the ratio of those uh, generalized singular values. What do these numbers mean? Um, okay, and this is, this is a description of the mathematics. And of course, I should mention that the generalized SVD was proposed by Charlie Van Loen in 76 and our very own, really your very own, Michael Saunders. <laughs> showed how this could be, how the GSVD can be robustly computed, which is um, really important for any applica application, and especially for our kind of applications where we look at very large data sets and they're growing. I should mention that. I could mention a bit more about it later. As I said also, again, we need to define some mathematical properties in the data in order to interpret the GSVD from the data. So we, we need to add to the mathematics to take it from just computing something to actually being a data science tool. And these are the results we get in this particular example. So in this example, I said we look at large data. We have three million regions in the genome. Really, the genome is th more or less three billion nucleotides, the human genome. Uh, we, we tried to, <laughs> we tried to uh, decrease the number of rows we had in the data. You see here the data are 90 degrees rotated, so here are essentially the rows we had earlier, and here are the columns. These are the patients. These are the genomic regions. So we have three million genomic regions, and in itself, it's already pretty large. It, it, it is also that the GSVD can be computed for 3 billion, and we're going to definitely try this. And, uh, and thanks to Michael here, actually, it can be computed <laughs> for, for such large data set. Um, what we find in the data with the GSVD, for example, is a pattern that the mathematics says it's exclusive to the tumor genome. Okay, that's what the mathematics says. What does it mean? Here is this pattern here. And we look at this pattern and it reminds us a similar exercise we did before where we looked at only lower grade astrocytomia, astrocytoma. This was measured with whole genome sequencing. This is measured with a different technology, Affymetrix microarrays. And we got a similar pattern that was exclusive to the tumor relative to the normal. Didn't happen in normal, only in a tumor. And then it reminds us another pattern, again, different technology, Agilent microarrays. Again, the, uh, the tumor exclusive pattern there. And in all cases, this, these patterns, it, this I guess is the left hand generalized singular vector in, both ca in all cases. And here we have the pattern, the right hand uh, generalized singular ve va uh, vector across the patients. This variation across the patients that the GSVD gets that corresponds to these patterns separates the patients and it separates the patients based upon their survival. 
So we were excited. We said, well, this, uh, this definitely, so, so for example, those patients here, their median survival is a year. And those patients here, their median survival is about five years. And again, it's because we also have lower grade astrocytoma for, for those who are in the know. We were excited about this because that means the patterns we find have some kind of medical meaning at least. Even though then when we looked a little bit more in yes. Uh, quick question. Sure. What, what does that mean that these look very similar? That there could be definitely less than 70%, sometimes less that they were, should they, for example, uh, the um, hedgehog signaling pathway is known to be involved in medulloblastoma, which is another type of brain cancer. And the notch signaling pathway is also known to be involved in very many types of cancers. Um, that one, any, everything that is in yellow actually was contributed by only one of the technologies, the technology of whole genome sequencing that gives us better resolution of the data. Because you see really these patterns, they come at completely different resolutions. They measure different regions in the genome, not the exact same. So. Uh, yeah, so here we have, say, almost 3 million. Here we have about 1 million regions. And here we have only 200,000 uh, regions. Um, anyway, that was what was tumor uh, specific. And um, I'm afraid to, I, I don't know. <laughs> OK, hold on, bear with me. I'm trying to, sw OK, cool. But then the question is, what else is, um, is uh, specific or, or uh, is tumor uh, exclusive or normal exclusive? And it turns out that we find batch effects, the very well known batch effects. So that again, the mathematics separates very nicely from the biological signal. So here we can see how they're co correlated with uh, the genomic characterization center in the case of the tumors and in the tissue source site in the case of the normal data. Just as a, an example, we've seen these kind of batch effects also looking at microarray data, but the batch effects are completely different. You see, you might say, well, that, those patterns look like noise, and we can characterize them in different ways. But once we move to a different technology, we get another pattern that looks like noise, but a completely different kind of noise. We don't need to characterize the noise because using the decompositions, the mathematics just separates it. The noise, it's an organized noise, or it's an artifact. The mathematics just separates it from the data. So we see in all these differences, just like we've seen them in our own uh, experiments that we ran, that I showed you before, but uh, we see them in, uh, obviously, in other people's experiments as well. But we're able to separate them from the data. For example, here's, here's a, a variation between a particular scanner at uh, Harvard Medical School relative to all other scanners. Just one kind of correlation. So, so you can see the kind of noises that are in the data. You don't need to guess them. The mathematics finds them for you. And you might ask, well, what is common to both data sets? The mathematics said this variation here across the patients, which is reproduced twice, this right-hand singular vector, it's common between the two uh, data sets. And when we look at it, we see that in the normal data, it identifies uh, what looks like a deletion of the X chromosome relative to the autosomes. Here are all the chromosomes, 1 to 22. Here is the X chromosome. It looks deleted relative to the autosome, also here in this data. And we see that it happens in some of the patients. And those turn out to be the male patients. So what we find is this normal variation, or if you want, X chromosome deletion in the male patients, which happens in the normal data. And it's conserved in the tumor data, because the tumor develops from the normal genome. If the tumor is a tumor in a male patient, it would be a tumor which starts with one less X chromosome than the tumor of a female patient. And we see this variation also in the tumor data. So to zero's order, this particular variation does not participate in the cancer biology. It's just normal variation. Normally what people do, or usually what people do, is they just throw out the X chromosome. They throw out the Y chromosome, they throw out the uh, mitochondrial DNA, they throw out anything that they suspect may be a result of a normal variation. But because we're using a decomposition that is comparative, that can separate what is common from what is exclusive, we're able to keep the X chromosome in our data, 
and the mathematics will just separate it for us. Uh, and maybe one of these days, we'll even get funding from the NIH, because uh, the NIH, I mean, we have funding from the National Cancer Institute, but the National Human Genome Research Institute, they have a particular call for funding for people who analyze the X chromosome and don't throw it out. For example, the Cancer Genome Atlas themselves, they published a whole nature paper on ovarian cancer, where the first thing they did in the pipeline was throw out the X chromosome, and you cannot find it anywhere in the paper. So they're looking for people to do this, and I guess we could do this. And we could analyze the X chromosome, we could analyze the whole genome together, and I you already know that there are so many regions here where there is normal variation that we just don't guess in advance. But the mathematics takes care of it for us, so we're not worried about it. Also, the mathematics corrected some of the gender labels, I should note, because that, like all other data, data come with um, attributes that are not always perfect in databases. So we had some patients that look like males and they were denoted as females and vice versa, and you never know, it's biology. We asked the Cancer Genome Atlas and they thanked us for correcting their labels. So it's nice to have mathematics that can also correct your data or find that maybe there's some inconsistencies in your data when you're looking at it. We can suggest now novel drug targets that correlate with outcome based on this analysis, because you remember this pattern correlates with outcome. It correlates with outcome, it, we learned, because we didn't know, we didn't know any of this. We just knew GSVD. <laughs> <laughs> and we learned more GSVD working with Michael. I'll get to that quickly, I hope. But um, we didn't know, but it turns out that, we actually, that this actually predicts survival better than the best indicator. The best indicator to date for glioblastoma is the patient age at diagnosis. It's been like that from 1950. It's better than grade for astrocytoma at large. It's better than the existing test, which look at just single genes. Um, and that suggests that bringing it to the clinic will help patients. It's also statistically independent of the prediction of all the available predictors, which means we're not, being, we're not using the, inf the genomic information today. It's not included in any way in the analysis. So we think that GD essentially is a theory. You may not agree it's a theory. But it definitely finds things, no, it's okay. But, uh, but we, we, we definitely find things that no other machine learning methods meet, uh, that no other machine learning methods find in the data. Uh, these data were, to some extent, sort of left for dead. You always find them in the supplements of papers. But here they are, and they give us those uh, amazing answers. Why do they work so well? Well, like I could go through uh, you know, all, all the different mathematical reasons, but I'll leave it for you to read for later. I just want to let you know that just like in the case of the mechanism we predicted, we also wanted to test this out um, somewhat experimentally. So we ran a retrospective clinical trial which validated this pattern as a predictor, predictor in the case of GBM. And uh, so we got the validation. We validated that it is better than age, which, as I said, been the best indicator since 1950. It is also independent of age, meaning that whatever we do genomically adds to the current information that people use. It's, um, if you want, orthogonal. It's not being used today at all. And the, those patterns were not, were not identified before, not because people did not try. People saw these alterations in the tumors of the, uh, uh, in, in the genomes of the tumors for, for decades. And there are all these different um, papers where people say, we see these different subtypes based on these data. We see subtypes of patients where we try to associate it with the patient outcome or with something about the disease and we're unable to. And here the GSVD did the association for us. So we think it's clearly the mathematics that enables finding these patterns. It's the mathematics that wasn't there before and now is being used to look at these kind of data. Um, so, um, so, so, this, so, so we think that this uh, clinical trial is a proof of principle. I should mention, and I'm really glad that uh, uh, Dr. Patel was able to join us from the Stanford Cancer Institute. And uh, visiting with him and, 
um, his team back in June, I also learned, because you see, we, we always learn when we come from the mathematics, and I, I learned from Dr. Patel that, yes, the, 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 this, this pattern may be very relevant to the clinic already now, the prognostic classification may be relevant, the diagnostic classification may be relevant, and the therapeutic predictions as well, but already just the prognostic classification that we have now could be used, so that was very encouraging, and we're definitely working to bring the results to the clinic somehow. There are more experiments that one could do, there's more modeling that one could do, but because here I'm visiting Michael, there's so much more mathematics that one could do. <laughs> no, it's seriously, um, so, so many times we, th we hear things about, we already know everything about linear algebra. Coming from physics, I'm familiar with these kind of uh, sentences, because uh, you know, for all time I did my PG in physics, we already knew everything that there is to know about physics, supposedly. Now, this is not true. We actually don't know everything. There's so much more that we need to find out. Even things like uniqueness properties. So, you know, the only <laughs> place where I know that the uniqueness properties of the SVD are described is in this book by Trefetten, who's, of course, um, a graduate of ICME. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, uh, earlier than I see, isn't it? Even, right, computer, S computer science. It's not SCCM. No, SCC SCCM was around. Oh, well, you said ICME. Right, well, uh, sorry. Okay, from SCCM, which was the precursor to ICME, I guess I would. I would say, yeah, so, <laughs> so he was a graduate of computer science here from, uh, yeah, definitely very early. And um, Edelman, who's his first graduate student, is now uh, working on the uniqueness properties and the geometrical interpretations of the GSVD. There is, so there's definitely a lot still to do. The, the, the perturbation theories of GSVD are, you know, they're just being worked out as we speak, essentially, there, there, there are lots of open questions. And one open question that is very relevant to us, and I, want, I wonder how much time I have. Am I already over time? Uh, no, <laughs> we've got the room until six, oh. so it's seven. Oh, we have it till six. Ten, You're ten, hosed. <laughs> no, no, okay, so uh, w one thing that is very relevant to us, as I said, is generalizing the mathematics to different data structures. So we looked at the GSVD, they were looking at two matrices, and as uh, Michael told you, we had the fantastic pleasure collaborating with him on generalizing it to more than two matrices. So here in the example we have, say, three matrices, but really it's any number of matrices. Because you see, obviously the GSVD, as I described just now, it's defined only for two matrices, and we wanted a decomposition that we could similarly interpret that finds what is similar and exclusive among more than just two data sets, because there's more than just two data sets that we want to look at at a time. And then we also are interested in extending the order of the GSVD, so uh, because Again, we might want to look at what is uh, common or exclusive between two or more data sets that have additional orders in the data, that they're not just two-dimensional matrices, but maybe three-dimensional uh, third-order tensors or other-order tensors. Um, and in this work with Michael, well, we, we started, I guess we started with Jean, and we uh, kindly asked Michael to join us. So we, we were thinking how how could we you know how could how could we define this decomposition? Because as I told you, once you in, include, once you go from the definition, say, for the SVD to the tensor SVD, or similarly when you go from the generalized SVD to the higher order GSVD, you have to give up some of the properties that you had before, and those properties are very nice mathematically. It was very it's very obvious how to compute this uh, matrix of shared right-hand generalized singular values with the GSVD. It's very obvious now, thanks to Michael's work. And the question is, how do we do it when we have more than two matrices? It wasn't all that obvious. We decided to concentrate on the quotients of the, um, of the, uh, I guess, the, 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 um, I guess uh, correlation matrices, the, I, the, the 
yeah, of this particular structure from each data that we get. So we're looking at each data set. We're, we're looking at the uh, correlation matrix of a, data, of a data set with itself. And we're looking at the quotients of those correlation matrices. And, by, and we want to diagonalize these matrices of the correlation uh, of the quotients of the correlation matrices. Because for two matrices, this gives us the GSVD. For two matrices, you could think of the GSVD as coming from the quotients of these correlation matrices. And then the question is, would we be able to do that for more than two matrices? What, what could we tell about um, these data sets? Would it work for us? Well, so, explain. Sure, you want to explain? Each matrix is called <laughs> D, not A. Oh, sorry. A is formed from D. But right. There's one other difficulty we haven't solved that we have to assume each D has full column rank because we're there's an inverse. <laughs> you can use a pseudo inverse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, yes. it's an open question. <laughs> yes. And, and obviously, well, since Michael gave us the robust way to compute the GSVD that does not involve matrix inverses, that, that, that matrix inverse is uh, still an open question. Uh, maybe the pseudo inverse solves it. <laughs> but yeah, the, and as I said, there are many open questions still. But Michael still kindly agreed to help us with this, even with the inverse. <laughs> But yeah, totally, the inverse uh, is, is, is a difficulty, right, as uh, you all know. Um, but so, so, well, we, so that's what, that was what, I guess, we thought about early on, Priya and I and, and Jean. And then uh, Priya and I applied it to data. I, I, we applied it to different kinds of data sets. You, you see here actual data. I won't go into the details. But by applying it to the data, just in the examples that we used, we saw that there are particular properties for this decomposition, which essentially extends to multiple matrices all the properties of the GSVD, except for the orthogonality of the left hand uh, generalized singular vectors. Really, except for the complete orthogonality, we still recover some orthogonality. And then we tried, so we saw this in data, and then we tried to prove this, uh, right, mathematically, because, you know, seeing it in data is one thing, and actually having a proof is a different thing. The proofs took us five years. <laughs> we would have never, right, you see the D here. This is uh, not nine years, only five years, 2006. And here it is, 2011, took us five years. Actually, the experiments with uh, John Diffley that we did, that I showed you earlier, also took us five years. So we're just slow in experiments and improving things in mathematics, but we saw it in the data. So we insisted, and with uh, Michael's uh, really thanks to Michael and his, with his great help, we were able to prove uh, these theorems. So now we know that this is not just something we see in the data, this, this, this actually holds. Um, we know that we get the GSVD. Uh, in the case of only two matrices, we know that we always have um, the, the eigen decomposition of the sum of quotients always uh, exists and works and gives us real eigenvectors and real eigenvalues. We also were able to prove this eigenvalue inequality. Eigenvalues are always greater or equal uh, to one. And that was um, the real difficulty, the eigenvalue inequality. That was what took most of the five years in, in the end. Once we were able to prove that, we were also able to show that those cases where here, the numbers here in the diagonal are all identical in all of the factorizations. Those are the cases that we're interested in from the data science point of view because they, they correspond to patterns in this matrix here that are of equal significance in all data sets. They're common. This is some phenomena that is 
uh, existing in all the data sets. We're able to, uh, to identify them by the mathematics of, of the eigenvalues. Essentially, eigenvalues are de de define those subspaces. And in these cases for the, the common subspace, we also see that the left hand the generalized singular vectors reach um, orthogonality. So we don't have all orthogonality of these matrices, but we have partial orthogonality in this particular subspaces. So that's just one example. In the case of, J so, so that was a generalization to uh, more than two matrices. There is a generalization to more than two orders when we're looking here, say, at three orders. In this case, the mathematics is somewhat more straightforward. So uh, these are the mathematical properties. They're really much more straightforward than in the case that took us five years. So adding an order to the, to the ten, making it tensors rather than matrices was easier than, I guess, adding numbers of matrices. But you, by, this, by using this, we're able to compare data just like I showed you before, but this time from aden this time from adenocarcinomas, and we were we, and different types. So it was lung, uterine, and ovarian adenocarcinomas, and we were able to find predictors that were not known before, and that also do things that no other indicators were able to predict before. Specifically, predict survival past the primary treatment as well as the benefit of platinum past the primary treatment for these diseases. Um, so I won't go much into the details, but really similarly to the case of the brain cancer, we're able to find patterns that repeatedly in different data sets measured by different technologies showed um, correlation with patient outcome. Correlation with patient outcome for patients that were treated with platinum, which is the first line systemic treatment in this disease. Um, and the same kind of variation, this time not across the whole genome, but just across two chromosome arms, 6P and 12P. I guess these diseases are a lot more heterogeneous. Um, we're able to map this back onto a pathway a diagram like we had before, where again, some of the uh, changes that we see were known, and many of them were previously unknown. Interestingly, in this case, some of the drug targets that the mathematics predict to be correlated with survival on their own, they already, some of them uh, already have drugs targeting them, and some of them are FDA approved, but not for adenocarcinomas necessarily. So th this might even be closer to the clinic than the previous example in terms of the therapeutic predictions. Just like I showed you before, we're able to separate batch effects. We have statistical independence from the other indicators. Specifically, in this case, it's a stage is the best um, indicator of a diagnosis. And then there are no predictors throughout the, the disease past the first treatment. So there was nothing to compare to there. And just like before, sorry. Sorry, I, I should explain. We normally do stop at 5.30, but it doesn't matter if we don't. But that's a good aim. So what's the time? Sorry, yeah, I'll, so I'll wrap up. <laughs> no. Okay, I'll wrap up, everybody, no worries. Maybe sure, sure. It's all fine. <laughs> Saved by Michael, everybody. <laughs> so anyway, just like before, we think we have uh, a theory. So this, as I said, you don't have to agree. We think it's a theory. It works for different types of cancers. The, Invariably, we find patterns that predict survival better than what, uh, whatever else is out there. And you might say, why is this a theory? And I will tell you, well, really, the GSVD, it's already a mathematical building block of algorithms, but also theories in physics in a way like the SVD. So there's no reason why, if we wanted to build a theory out of data in biology, why won't we go to the GSVD and its generalizations? And that's a generalization that I'm hoping to rope Michael into helping us with, <laughs> right? So now we want to include multiple tensors, essentially to build upon the work where we have multiple matrices and add an additional order. Um, 
And I want to mention that the SVD also underlies our ability to understand statistics of data sets. And that statistics, again, as we know from physics, once we have the statistics of data, we can um, understand the principles of uh, the, pr the, the, the processes. It's a characterization of the processes that gave rise to the data. So we learn something about the data. So here is just one quick example. And the SVD essentially identifies uh, distribution functions from data in particular cases. And you could look also at this paper from Gene. And in this particular case, we were able to predict mechanisms again, which actually recently there seemed to be some biochemical uh, process that's a candidate for describing, for, for, for uh, uh, deriving this particular mechanism, uh, obviously by a completely different lab, a biochemistry lab. So in physics, um, being able to model and experimentally measure is really the basics of the, the basis of the effectiveness of mathematics. So mathematics, I it's a surprise that mathematics describes the physical world, but there it does. And now we can, you know, send thingies to outer space thanks to that. Uh, can we do this in biology? Yes, I say yes, we can. Um, and this is what's driving our work. We, we hope to be able to uh, control, say, cell division in real time and in vivo by understanding these biological mechanisms um, the way that we do, starting from data. So in physics, usually people will tell you, well, where are differential equations? Uh, I say before there were differential equations, there were data, right? And I want to thank uh, my collaborators, so obviously Michael and Jill at Case Western Research University, who's been a fantastic collaborator on the retrospective clinical trial. We wouldn't have, en have been able to do it without her. And Priya, my lab alumna, who's the co-founder of EigenGene, and also visited this uh, distinguished uh, seminar series before, and I guess Larson is now the um, Vice President for Systems Biology at Sage Bio Networks, which is a not-for-profit offshoot of Merck. Uh, Joel, who has his own lab uh, at the Medical School of Cornell University. Of course, I want to thank the NCI for their fantastic support. <laughs> we did get some funding from the National Human Genome Research Institute back in the day, and maybe we'll get it again. Anyways, thank you. Thanks so much, Charlie. It's sure. It's wonderful that you're doing far more than linear algebra. You're <laughs> keeping track of the physical interpretation. Thank you. In, in physics, astrophysics, and medicine. <laughs> Who knows what else? Thanks, anyway, Michael. Question time. Uh, what you, okay. you mentioned uh, eigenbeam. <laughs> And um, so what is your startup trying to do? What's the goal? And uh, in a short elevator. Money. <laughs> totally. Well, we're trying to bring the mathematical technology to the clinic. So specifically collaborate, I guess, with other businesses on um, to have partnerships where we can bring the mathematics to bear. So say, prospective clinical trials where we can help drugs progress from phase one to um, FDA approval. For um, cancer drugs, I forget the numbers, but they're extremely miserable over the last several decades, the number of cancer drugs that were approved. Many think it's because we are unable to identify the patients who will benefit from the drug in the trial. So here we have a way to identify the patients who benefit from drugs. Many, including the medical doctors, so you talk with medical doctors and they say, well, I had this drug which was an experimental drug. Some patients had fantastic response to it and some patients didn't. I'll give you an example. Actually, uh, uh, really quickly, I know you want an elevator pitch. I'm sorry, I'm just the CTO and not the CEO, so I suppose I'm not as good. I suppose I should hone it. But just to quickly show you, 
if we look at these aberrations, if I'm able to go back to them, um, where are the aberrations? Well, one of the genes that changes is, is a growth uh, factor receptor, receptor, EGFR. And there were EGFR inhibitors, because it's amplified, that were tested on glioblastoma patients. The trial failed miserably because they were trying to, to figure out which patients will benefit from this by measuring just the change in EGFR in the tumor genomes. However, already with studies in mice, biologists see that the strain of the mouse, meaning the whole genome, is relevant to understanding what will be the response of the mouse to an EGFR inhibitor. So uh, if this is so in mice, why don't we implement this in, in um, humans? Why don't we look at the whole genome rather than looking at just this uh, one EGFR, um, just at EGFR alone? So that's just one example. Um, so yeah, <laughs> did, did I answer your question? Someone, okay, hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta work it out. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that proving the 